Now, ultimately, even though the Discovery Institute did not instigate the lawsuit, now they wanted a lawsuit, they wanted one for a long time, but they didn't want one there. Uh, they wanted one either in Kansas or Ohio, where they thought they could control everything. They didn't want it there. That popped up out of left field. But ultimately, all of this is because of their efforts. In 1990, the Discovery Institute was established as a conservative think tank in Seattle. In 1996, they established the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture, which is now called the Center for Science and Culture. Um, there is Bruce Chapman, who founded um, both entities, doing what he does best, talking to the media there on the Lara News Hour. Um, there in the middle is Stephen Meyer, a historian and philosopher of science who is the director of the Center for Science and Culture. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, as it's probably its most famous figure to the public, is Michael Behe, who wrote Darwin's Black Box, and he's got a new book out. William Dembski, who gave us that wonderful little animated um, cartoon, um, whose book, uh, Intelligent Design, The Bridge Between Science and Theology, explains intelligent design to the lay audience in overtly religious terms. Um, there is Philip Johnson in the lower right with uh, one of their ardent supporters, Chuck Colson, the convicted Watergate felon, uh, now uh, who runs Prison Fellowship Ministries. I'm sure you probably heard of that. Um, and there is Jonathan Wells. Um, he's one of the founders of this little group, too. He's one of the founding members, standing in front of the Unification Theological Seminary. You probably know what that place is. He calls Reverend Sun Myung Moon his father, spiritual father, and so he has a degree from there. But Reverend Moon asked him to go get a Ph.D. in, in biology so that he could devote his life to destroying Darwinism. And there he is in the state of Ohio in March 2002 doing his best to destroy Darwinism, trying to persuade the Ohio Board of Education to adopt intelligent design into the teaching standards, the science standards. So here you have the people who are ultimately responsible for what happened in Dover. And they have a strategy called the wedge strategy. And Philip Johnson came up with this based on the metaphor of the wood splitting wedge. The idea is to create an opening in the public mind, the public understanding of science, to allow the supernatural or God as a scientific explanation. And this is what they call the wedge strategy. Uh, with Philip Johnson's work beginning in 1991 as the thin end of the wedge with the younger members of the movement coming in his wake, ha having created an opening for them in the public mind and with public policy makers. So, and this, this strategy is outlined in a, a, a document known informally as the wedge document or called the wedge. Many of you may know Jim Still with Internet Infidels a very nice uh, man who I think wrote one of the first articles on this document when it surfaced on the internet in 1999. Um, it is the strategy of the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture over a period of 20 years. There are three phases, scientific research, writing, and publicity. Phase two, publicity and opinion making. Phase three, cultural confrontation and renewal. They've done every part of this strategy except the science. There you see the leaker, Matt Duss, whose identity was not divulged until after the Kitz Miller trial was over and we had the judge's decision. But Tim Rhodes posted the document on the web in 99 and he gave, I think I'm the first person to whom he gave a copy of the original scanned version. So it became the foundation of my research that, that led to the publication of my book. Now, so, and the publication of the book Creationism's Trojan Horse is what got me called into the trial as an expert witness. Um, and so I was deposed in New Orleans on June 6, 2005, which is my, my son who's moving. That was his birthday. Um, Richard Thompson, who's the director of the Thomas More Law Center, which was founded with Tom Monahan of uh, Domino's Pizza, very conservative um, religious right legal organization, he deposed me, and he also questioned me at the trial. There's Eric Rothschild from Pepper Hamilton Law Firm, who worked with me to prepare me for my testimony. Um, and so in the room with us, um, during my deposition um, was William Dembski, who looked about like he looks in this picture during the entire length of his presence there. Um, he glowered at me across the table. And um, so he was there at my deposition. So this took place on June 6th. Now, um, a month before that, almost exactly a month, Dembski had written on his Uncommon Descent blog, he was really talking tough. He says, what I would really like to have is a strategy for interrogating the Darwinists to squeeze the truth out of them. And he called this his vice strategy. And there is a little picture of Darwin with his head being squished in a vice grip. Now, 
But Dembski was due to be deposed exactly one week after I was. He was due to be deposed on June 13, 2005, and I want you to remember that little item of information. It will be relevant in a little bit. Anyway, so as you know, um, <laughs> I was, uh, you know about Hurricane Katrina, everybody knows about that. So um, a, while we were still suffering from the effects of Hurricane Katrina, um, the Thomas More Law Center filed a motion in limine to have me um, kicked out of the, 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 the case. I, these, I was the only person on the plaintiff's side, to, you know, that they tried to get kicked off the case. Uh, and so they filed a brief which uh, said, and Dembski's fingerprints are all over this, that uh, she's little more than a conspiracy theorist and a web-surfing cyber-stalker of the Discovery Institute. Now, officially they were trying to get me disqualified under the Supreme Court ruling Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals 1993, which, in which the, judge, uh, the court ruled that judges have to decide whether or not the scientists who are expert witnesses um, are really uh, have used the proper scientific methodology, and they have to do this at the beginning of the, the testimony. And, of course, I wasn't brought in as a scientist, so it didn't apply to me. Uh, but the judge denied that motion. And so uh, when he denied the motion, they filed it on the 6th of September. I I'm sitting in my house about all this time. I was without power for nine days, and I was sitting in a south window of my house uh, trying to get enough light to prepare for the trial. Um, and so while this was being, all this is going on. And so... Um, I want you to remember what you're going to see. After, after the judge denied the motion on the 22nd of September, um, the Discovery Institute weighed in on this. But I want you to remember that these are the people uh, who are claiming that uh, intelligent design is a full-scale revolution. There's Dembski in 2004. And there, right before the trial began, um, Stephen Meyer says we're in the very initial stages of a scientific revolution. Uh, well... I was um, sitting in my office, which was the only place where the lights were back on and where it was air conditioned, uh, preparing to, to go to, well, we had a second hurricane, Rita. And so we was, I couldn't get out of Baton Rouge. So I was reading the website of the Discovery Institute, and I saw where they had posted the transcript of a radio interview that I had done, except that I had not done it. It's a fake interview uh, with me and a fictitious host named Marvin Waldberg in which they refer to me as Dr. Barking Forest. So that's why I you know, have the title Dark, Dr. Barking Forest Cyberstalker. Um, so this is a, just kind of one of the little funny things that they did prior to the trial starting, actually, right before I left to go up there. Um, so... Uh, the first half of the first day of my time on the stand, the Thomas More Law Center is still trying to get me disqualified, but the judge, kind of funny, called me a hybrid expert um, historian, and he allowed me to stay into the case, and I testified um, for a day and a half. These were our expert witnesses, the plaintiffs. Um, I'm one of them, of course, with Robert Pinnock, who's a philosopher, Kevin Padian, who's a paleontologist, Ken Miller, cell biologist, John Haught, a theologian. Brian Alters, somebody talked about Dr. Alters today. He's a science education expert. And Jeffrey Shallot, who was brought in as a rebuttal, uh, he's a computer scientist who was brought in as a rebuttal um, witness to Dembski, but uh, didn't actually, Jeff didn't get to uh, do that, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, the consultants for the um, plaintiff's attorneys of the National Center for Science Education, there is Nick Matsky, who was there for the entire six weeks of the trial. And there, there's a nice little book that uh, has come out after the trial. It's a handbook for activists, which incorporates what was learned at the trial. So if any of you are interested, this is a very nice little book. And, and all of the trial documents are on the NCSC's website, if you're interested. Uh, and these are our wonderful attorneys, uh, Stephen Harvey and Eric Rothschild from Pepper Hamilton, Vic Waljack of the Pennsylvania ACLU, and Richard Katsky of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. So this was our 